some years back, an article was published in the St. Cloud, Minnesota newspaper. It told that a Lutheran church was making what they called prayer beads. Whatever you do, don't call them rosary beads, the article declares. The Lutheran woman minister, Erica Kennedy, explained, you may want to let them slide through your fingers and let your heart, mind, and soul relax on each bead. Mostly, I think people appreciate knowing they are connected to others and being prayed for. Such beads really do not amount to praying, as the Lutheran Church tells that they can be used for stress or to chase away negative energy. One person tells that there are more Lutheran churches that are doing this, which may come as a surprise to people because it's associated with Catholics, or so I think. You know, the devil is called the monkey of God as Satan imitates holy things while making a counterfeit. The newspaper article tells that Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, and the Baha'i faith also use prayer beads. The number of beads varies by religion or use. For example, Islamic prayer beads traditionally have 99 or 33 beads, while Buddhists and Hindus use 108 beads or 27 beads, which are counted four times. Prayer beads in religion are used to mark the repetition of prayers chants or devotions, such as the Rosary of Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. One member of the Lutheran Church who makes the beads says, but we don't just pray to Mary. We like the idea that they are comforting to others. When I was, when I was a religious brother, we wore the rosary around the neck as part of our religious attire. A gas station attendant once pointed to my rosary and declared, he's a bead freak. I explained, it's a rosary. The attendant was aware of the rosary, but held it in contempt as he scoffed, well, I'm sorry to hear that how rude it was that he should ridicule me on account of my Catholic faith. And to think that he ridiculed me even as I was patronizing his place of business. It is the only time that I have been ridiculed on account of the rosary. Let us reflect on how to pray the rosary. St. Louis Marie de Montfort acknowledges that most Catholics make use of devotion to the rosary. I take my reflection from the secret of the rosary. So St. Louis Marie de Montfort asks, so why is it then that so few of them, Catholics, give up their sins and go forward in the spiritual life. Surely it must be because they are not saying them as they should. It is a good thing to think over how we should pray if we really want to please God and become more holy. He points out that to say the rosary to advantage one must be free from mortal sin 
or at least be resolved to give up sin and pray in beseeching God's assistance. If thou art offering thy gift at the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has anything against thee, leave thy gift before the altar, and go first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. If prayer is to be acceptable to God, we must be living without sin, even against our neighbor. For a sin against our neighbor is a sin against God. Since God created all men, desiring all men to attain their eternal salvation. St. Louis Marie de Montfort explains that God hears the prayers not only of those in the state of grace, but also of those who are in mortal sin. For otherwise, those in the state of sin would have no purpose to pray at all. This is a teaching of our Holy Mother, the Church. Because, of course, sinners need to pray far more than good people do. Were this horrible doctrine true, it would then be useless and futile to tell a sinner to say all or even part of his rosary because it would never help him. We earnestly beg everyone to say the Holy Rosary, the just that they may persevere and grow in God's grace, and sinners that they may rise from their sins. St. Louis Marie de Montfort continues to forcefully point out that the rosary is an insult to God if prayed mechanically, so to say. St. Louis Marie de Montfort relates, One day Our Lady appeared to an immoral man who used to always say his rosary every day. She showed him a bowl of beautiful fruit, but the bowl itself was covered with filth. The man was horrified to see this. And Our Lady said, This is the way you are honoring me. You are giving me beautiful roses in a filthy bowl. Do you think I can accept presents of this kind? The rosary is to be prayed with attention and devotion. It must not be prayed so rapidly as to cause the one praying with you to be out of breath and trying to keep up. I recall on a flight that the stewardess was making the pre-flight announcements so quickly as to require the closest attention. She was also making jokes as if to entertain the people. Seated beside me was a businessman from Mexico City. Although fluent in English, he spoke slowly. Was the, case, was the hasty announcement of the stewardess respectful to him? And it is inconsiderate that jokes, silly jokes, were being made along with the announcement because those who are not altogether familiar with flying might not be able to understand the announcements. Let us always be considerate when praying with others. If you are inclined to pray quickly, make a point to slow down, to pray and listen to those who are praying with you, to keep pace with them. In this way, the rosary is a common prayer, a prayer prayed in unison with others. Our parishes have the hallmark of praying the rosary. The rosary will keep us fervent in the practice of the faith. The rosary prayed before Mass better disposes you to benefit from the Mass. 
As you pray the rosary, I am fulfilling my priestly duty in the confessional. Father Clement Kubisch, who was pastor during my high school years and early seminary years, told that he would wish to join the faithful in the prayers before Mass. But his priestly duties obliged him to hear confessions only on occasion. As with the Tuesday evening holy hour, do I appreciate the opportunity of leading the rosary, praying the rosary with the parish, while another priest hears confessions. Let us also recall when, by chance, Brother Angelus, St. Dominic, and St. Simon Stock met on the street. Brother Angelus made a prophecy. One day, through the scapular and the rosary, the world will be saved. How can it be said that the rosary and scapular will save the world when the Mass is the sacrifice of Christ himself upon the altar? The prophecy can only mean that the Mass would be unavailable and the faith of people would be maintained by the scapular and rosary. Could it be that in our times, this prophecy has been fulfilled at least in part? For the Mass has been universally destroyed. Those faithful who cling to tradition have held fast to the scapular and the rosary. In the absence of traditional clergy. And so in holding fast to the faith and remaining united together, the traditional faith has gradually spread by priests who had remained faithful to the true mass and by more priests being ordained. In my own family, the rosary was appreciated At a time, a traditional priest was available two hours away. On Sundays, we made the long drive, packed in the family station wagon. Very often, however, a priest was not available. And so we gathered for the rosary. Sunday was a special day. As dad instilled in us that it was a day of rest. On this one day a week, he made the paper route easier. Instead of riding our bike, as we boys successively had a paper route, he would take us around the paper route driving in the car to make it a bit easier. After breakfast, the family gathered for the mass prayers and the rosary. We also prayed the rosary daily. After the rosary was finished, the youngest in the family enjoyed blowing out the shrine candle. The candle got such a vigorous blowing that the melted wax would splatter onto the wooden mantle. But I don't need to share my own memories of the rosary. Every Catholic home truly cherishes the rosary. The family gathers in the evening, perhaps after dinner, or before the young ones are put off to bed. And so the rosary is known as a family prayer. I recall how Father Dennis Chicoin, God rest his soul, would say that if you are too busy for the daily rosary, well, you're too busy. You would do well to cut something out of your busy day rather than to not take time to pray the rosary. Remember Father Peyton's slogan, the family that prays together stays together. Father Peyton explained, if families will but listen and give Our Lady the daily family rosary, 
I assure them that their homes will become, by God's grace, peaceful, prayerful places, little heavens, which God, the author of home life, has intended they should be. The rosary is a universal devotion. Once on a flight, I concluded praying my breviary. As I put my breviary away, the woman beside me said, I saw you praying the office. So I prayed my rosary. Each week, by the divine office, the priest prays all 150 psalms. The rosary, as another psalter, is comprised of 15 decades, each binding together 10 aves. Each decade begins with the Our Father and concludes with the glory be in praise of the Trinity. In all, there are 150 Hail Marys, as there are 150 Psalms. Just as the bravery is the universal prayer of the clergy, so also the rosary is the universal prayer of the church. On Sundays, as we have three Masses, we pray the full 15 decades of the rosary um, before, before the Masses taken all together. And so keep in mind, if you are the one leading the rosary before the first Mass of the day, the joyful decades of the rosary should be led. Before the 1030 Mass, the sorrowful decades of the rosary will be led. And then finally, preceding the five o'clock mass, the glorious decades are, le are led. Let me conclude with a story. Somewhere across the zonal border in one of the districts under the Soviet rule, after the Second World War, people gathered day after day towards sunset near a creek which marks the dividing line between the, west, the east and west zones of, of Germany. They gathered there to adore the Blessed Sacrament and to say the rosary. Across the creek, an emergency chapel had been dedicated by a refugee priest who ministered to the needs of the people, who, like these others, in the Soviet zone, had become Catholics without a home. They knelt in the grass, rain or shine, and prayed devoutly. Since they had no priest or church of their own, they went to the creek, where at least they could see a small chapel and hear the bell, which announced the coming of Christ upon the altar at consecration. They bowed in humble adoration. Often there were tears in their eyes, for they were not allowed to cross the creek to receive their God, hidden under the appearances of bread and wine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.